you so much for coming here uh, tonight, uh, today, tonight, <laughs> today. Um, my name is Olesa Kromychuk. I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. We're a charity that works to raise awareness about Ukraine um, in the UK and beyond. And it's really good to see such a great turnout today here to discuss Ukraine um, and hear from the voices from Ukraine and about Ukraine at this extremely, extremely difficult time for the country and the world. Um, we're really grateful to the Ukrainian Cathedral for hosting us here. Um, um, and, and most of our events are actually taking place here. Normally, for those of you who have followed us for years, we normally hold our events at 79 Holland Park, but that is not available uh, to us at the moment. So uh, we've been here, and that's wonderful that the cathedral hosts us. So thank you very much for that. And really, um, our guests don't need much of an introduction at all, but I will briefly introduce them anyway. We've got our guest of honor today, Andrei Kurkov, uh, one of the most famous writers from Ukraine. I'm sure you've all read um, lots of his books and hopefully the recent Gravies. Can I just lift this? Yeah, it's not sorry. my copy, but I have my own copy. <laughs> um, which is about the war uh, in Ukraine, um, about the war that started in 2014, and about the Grey Zone. If you haven't read it, please do so. It's absolutely uh, amazing. And Dre is president of PEN Ukraine, and I'm also really... Um, thrilled to say that he is one of our patrons, the patron of the Ukrainian Institute London. So we're extremely honored uh, to have him here today and grateful that he found the time to speak uh, to you today. Uh, and Andrei will be in conversation with Mark Forsyth, um, a Sunday Times number one best-selling author, blogger and journalist. Again, another writer that does not need much of an introduction. Um, I'm about to pass on the floor to uh, the two uh, speakers, but just a, a sort of brief housekeeping um, moment. But we will be recording this discussion. It will go on YouTube. Just, just, just um, bear that in mind if you're going to ask questions. And also, we're taking some photos today um, just for our social media and um, uh, archive of the Ukrainian Institute. So if you don't want to appear on any of them, just signal to us and we'll make sure that you don't appear on them. Uh, okay, um, well, over to you, Mark and Andrei. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with the uh the big question, big picture question, because um, uh, Vladimir Putin, I think most of us will have seen him, announcing that the Ukrainians and the Russians are one people and that there is no real difference there, except for a little bit of um, drug taking and stuff. Uh, is that true or is, I mean, Vladimir couldn't be here tonight to ask, so <laughs> is that true? Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, is it true? I mean, uh, First of all, Paul, I should explain that I am political Ukrainian, I'm citizen of Ukraine, I'm of Russian origin, and uh, who grew up in Ukraine and who acquired a Ukrainian uh, mentality uh, by the place where I grew up. So, I, I mean, I can see the difference, and I assure you, and I probably can assure, uh, I, I, I like the way you pronounce uh, Putin's surname, Putin. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I can assure him also and prove him that these are two different people, peoples and uh, with two different mentalities and uh, actually uh, with different histories, although sometimes in different epochs the history was almost uh, the same, like in the Soviet Union. But uh, I mean if we are talking about mentality, and this is very important to understand that uh, Russia was always a monarchy. First of all, Russia was created by Ukraine, by today's Ukraine, by Kiev. Kiev is 1,540 years old. Uh, Kiev's Rus was first smaller and then it became growing and then the separate republics like Novgorod Republic was set up and at some point Kiev's Prince Yuri Dolgoruki decided to create Moscow and he built Moscow. He is buried in Kiev on the territory of uh, Pichersky Lavra, the main monastery of uh, Ukrainian, so-called Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate. And uh, Ukrainians were they, they never had their own uh, royals or aristocrats. 
in fact. I mean, the, the formation of Ukrainian mentality uh, happened in 15th, 16th, 17th century. First part of Ukraine, half of Ukraine, was part of the Lithuanian Kingdom, which was the biggest uh, state in Europe in 13th century, in 14th century. Uh, then it became Polish-Lithuanian Kingdom. Uh, and then uh, Ukraine suddenly became independent ter territory, which was electing the Getmans. Getman was the head of the army and the head of the state. Uh, the elections were actually taking place not only of Getman, but also of the higher officers of Cossack's army. There were no fixed borders because the, all the borders were front lines. The Cossacks were fighting with Poles, uh, with Russians, with Tatars in the south, sometimes together with Crimean Tatars against Poles, etc. So, I mean, it was like 200 years of different wars, but uh, uh, their own territory, their own uh, diplomatic service. In Istanbul archives, you can find correspondence between Sultan and different Ukrainian Getmans. Uh, there was a legal system and military courts. They were also corrupt, like in Ukraine today. And there are famous historical cases when uh, Getman Mazep actually managed to, to get uh, one of the higher uh, Ukrainian officers uh, condemned of treason and uh, executed because this officer was against uh, the marriage of his daughter with Getman Mazep or something like this. This is also, but uh, the Ukrainians never had monarchy, uh, never respected any authority. So once actually Getman was elected, there would be immediately intrigues against him and attempts to remove him and to install or to elect different Getman. And uh, so, I mean, they are individualists, they are anarchists, but the Ukrainian anarchy is very well organized, usually. It's not <laughs> chaos. And in this sense, uh, uh, Russians are collective people. I mean, they have collective yes. mentality. They love their Tsars. When they are upset by a Tsar, they kill him and they love the next one. But they are always around the Tsar. And they always want to expand. And actually, for Ukrainians, freedom is more uh, important than stability. And sometimes, not like now, it's more important than life. For Russians, uh, uh, I mean, th those Russians, I'm not talking about all Russians everywhere in California and Israel, but those who are part of the Russian society today in Russia, for them, stability is more important than freedom. And, and actually, this thing was imposed on them by Russian television, by politicians who are telling them all the time that actually the system protects them from the enemies from the West. And I mean, we, we have our repetition of the history. I mean, the Cold War uh, of 1950s uh, was uh, supported by the Soviet media explaining that the danger comes from the West. Uh, so in fact, actually, I mean, Kyiv has now 5,000 bomb shelters. Most of them were built uh, in, in case of the war with NATO. But uh, going back, coming back to, 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 to mentality. So, uh, in the, I mean, uh, the Soviet mentality, which is now more or less Russian mentality, was uh, imposed on Ukraine uh, through Russification, through the Russian language. Because once you start, uh, forget your mother tongue, and you start uh, using foreign language, uh, you acquire uh, also a culture of this language and you acquire very often the, uh, not the habits and sort of uh, uh, smaller psychological things. I mean, like when I had been studying Japanese language and I spoke Japanese, every time I, I would speak Japanese, I, I would do like this. <laughs> Automatically, I mean. Uh, but so, so what happened, starting from 1920s, uh, the Russian language was removing Ukrainian from official use and was sort of pushing Ukrainian language further west. And after the independence in 1991, when actually uh, Ukrainian language was no more uh, suppressed or mistreated, the Ukrainian language was coming back to the east together with Ukrainian individualist mentality. And the Russian-speaking territories in the east and in the south, they were still representatives of the collective mentality. But every year this border between mentalities was moving towards East. And if there were no war, and if Ukrainian politicians were more dedicated to the country and more professional, and they could accelerate actually this process from the very beginning, then we would have uh, the border between Russia and Ukraine as the border between two mentalities, and there would be no chance to create fake republics and to, uh, to just uh, find a reason to start aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine. 
Yeah, well, that's a very full answer. Um, uh, you, are, you are, though, um, your, your first language is Russian. Yeah, it's and, my mother tongue. Uh, yes, and indeed you write your books in Russian, and they're banned in Russia, uh, which is, uh, sort of tells you all you need to know. But, I mean, one of the uh, other things that um, uh, I'm sure my friend Vlad would want to ask if he were here is um, the, the bullying of Russian speakers, which is meant well, to occur. I mean, you choose very strange friends. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, well, I mean, in fact, uh, 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 these Ukrainian civilians who are killed uh, in the first two weeks of the war, they are, from my point of view, mostly are Russian speakers and ethnic Russians, because east and south of Ukraine are, uh, I mean, in, inhabited, but, but mostly by Russian speakers. I mean, Kharkiv, uh, the huge city in the east of the country, 30 kilometers from Russian border, until 1934 was the capital of Ukraine, and it was completely Ukrainian speaking. And after the war, it just suddenly became completely Russian speaking city, and today 90, 95% of uh, people in Kharkiv speak Russian. Mariupol, which is bombarded now, and practically destroyed, and today a mosque was hit by shell, and in this mosque there are 80 people hiding, including Turkish citizens. Mariupol uh, has a pop Greek population, Russian-speaking Greek population, Russian-speaking Tatar and Armenian population, and Ukrainian and Russian population. So, so I mean, uh, who is mistreating Russian speakers in this situation? I mean, it's very easy to understand. My books were published always in Russian in Ukraine, but they also translated into Ukrainian language. I did have a lot of discussions in the last 30 years with Ukrainian nationalists, but these were discussions, they were not fights, I was never attacked. And I know that there are people in Ukraine who don't consider me a uh, Ukrainian writer because I write in Russian, but there are much more people who consider me a Ukrainian writer because I write about Ukraine, I'm a Ukrainian, Ukrainian citizen, I have my books in Ukrainian, I can uh, do events in both without problem, Ukrainian and Russian, etc. So, I mean, Ukraine is a multicultural society with many minorities. I mean, we have a uh, Hungarian minority, 250,000 people living in Transcarpathian region with their own literature, with their own literary magazines, with their literary festival in Hungarian language. They write in Hungarian about Ukraine. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, they are Hungarian. Uh, they, they are Ukrainian writers, but of course, I mean, unfortunately, they were ignored for many years, and uh, not, you cannot find many translations from Hungarian into Ukrainian now. I mean, we have Polish minority, Romanian minority, Greek minority, etc. Uh, so, so, I mean, for me, the national culture is uh, created by all Ukrainian citizens who live in Ukraine and who write about Ukraine or paint paintings about Ukraine. Yeah, but, uh, but I, I, as I say, I mean, uh, we have in Ukraine uh, a small group of quite noticeable refugee writers from Donbass region and Lugansk region, and some from Crimea. I mean, they didn't go to Moscow, although I mean they were awarded by. Uh, Russian uh, juries different prizes before the war. But when war started and the Lugansk and Donetsk got occupied, I mean, they, they moved to the east, to, to, to the west, yes. to, to Vinitsa, to, to Kiev, to, to Lviv. So I think it's much more d dangerous to be a Russian in Russia than a Russian uh, in, in Ukraine. Yeah, and just, uh, just to give everyone a, a little example of this that I noticed, when we were, I was with uh, Andre and we were walking across a square in Lviv this a couple of years ago, and um, somebody stopped Andrew to talk to him and um, the conversation went on for a couple of minutes and at the end of it, as we walked on, I, because I don't speak either Russian or Ukrainian, I was just out of interest, so I said, which language were you talking just now? And Andrew went, I don't know, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't actually remember what language he was speaking in 30 seconds before. Um, so everyone has been turning westward, as you say, um, from, uh, from the east. Uh, and uh, so tell us about, because uh, you did your wonderful book, uh, Ukraine Diaries, as it's uh, called in uh, Britain, about uh, the Maidan uh, uprising of, uh, or revolution of 2014. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what it was like in Kiev at the time? Well, maybe uh, then it, it's, it's uh, well, yeah, I think I should go back again to mentality, <laughs> to Ukrainian mentality, because without this, uh, it's, yeah, it's yeah. impossible to, to uh, explain. In, in fact, the first Ukrainian revolution uh, happened in 1991-1990. It was called the Revolution on the Granite. This, the, these were the first students' protests, and Ukrainians love to protest. And actually, yeah. every Ukrainian government is afraid of the street people. 
of the people who can come and demand justice, etc. So this is also the result of this individualistic mentality. And the fact is actually, uh, example I, I should mention, and maybe you don't know that uh, Ukraine can be uh, registered in the uh, Guinness Book of Records as the country with the biggest number of political parties registered in the Ministry of Justice. I think now it is more than 400. In fact, before the war you could uh, buy a small party uh, and I can explain you how to buy if you want to buy. I mean, it's like 20, 30 thousand euros or, or dollars and you are the, the head of the party which was already registered 10 years ago and you can t go to the local elections, etc. But uh, every Ukrainian has his own idea what to do in the country. I mean, uh, and if you compare with the one-party system of the Soviet Union and one-party one system of, of Russia, it, it, it's clear that actually it's, it's very difficult for uh, Russians and Ukrainians to find a common language on politics. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, 40 million people each has uh, his or her, her own image of the best kind of Ukraine to live in in the future. In Russia, they all have the same image of great Russia. And uh, uh, the first students' protests were, I, I don't remember already what was it about the language or about something else, but uh, the Orange Revolution happened because uh, the Ukrainians got fed up with falsified elections. And they didn't want to have uh, a guy uh, with uh, two terms in prison, uh, ex-governor of uh, Don, 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 Donetsk and Donbass, who is also a character, uh, tiny character in, the, in this book. They didn't want to, to have such a president in the country. In the end, actually, he managed to become a president, but, uh, uh, but not for long, uh, because, I mean, uh, he was almost ready to sign the agreement with Europe about a cessation treaty, when uh, probably Putin blackmailed him and offered him $15 uh, billion dollars, uh, in exchange for a uh, new union between Russia and Ukraine. And then, actually, the Ukrainians started protesting. And first, uh, when the first students' protests started in November uh, 2013, I was very dubious about this protest because I thought they could, be, uh, could have been orchestrated by the presidential administration just to show that there are real protests, but not many people are protesting, so we'll go ahead with the new treaty with Russia instead of treaty with Europe. But, uh, I mean, the, the presidential administration or ministry of police were stupid enough to, to beat these students up. And on the next day, there were already uh, tens of thousands of Ukrainians on the Maidan Square in, in the central Kyiv, and there were tens of thousands of Ukrainians coming to Kyiv from all around Ukraine. And I spent the uh, first two weeks of the Maidan just walking there and talking to people, trying to understand actually what do they want, because th there was no leader and this is interesting because, I mean, Ukrainians don't need a leader to, to rise. Yeah. This is a, uh, also a unique feature. And, uh, and they didn't have uh, common slogans or common uh, goals. So, I mean, what I understood that actually people who came from different regions, I mean, they came because of the, uh, being unhappy with their local politicians or local authorities. And they thought that the best uh, way to protest about something local is to go to the capital and to join everybody else who is protesting. So after two weeks uh, of this, uh, what do you call it, Browns movement, uh, Browns. Brownian. Brownian motion. Brownian, Brownian motion. motion, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 then actually the, the, the ideas of the Maidan were crystallized. And they, the, first of all, they wanted to... Uh, uh, the dismissal of the minister of police who ordered to beat up the students, uh, it didn't happen. Then they started asking for more. They wanted actually uh, the dismissal of the prime minister Azarov. Uh, and then when it, this didn't happen, and in fact actually at, at this time, Russia sent uh, security service advisors to, uh, to Yanukovych and probably some snipers. And in Concha Zaspa, where the state duchess are situated, there were 27 colonels and different higher officers from, from Russia. And they were planning how to deal with the protests, but the protests were growing. And I, I, I mean, I will not retell you the whole uh, story, but in the end, you know that President Yanukovych had to flee. 
The first victims uh, of Maidan were one Ukrainian Armenian, Sergei Nigayan, from Dnipropetrovsk then, and the c citizens of Belarus, uh, Zhiznevsky. The, these were the first protesters who were killed in, in, in Ukraine, and then the bloody phase of the uh, Maidan revolution began. And the result, you know, over 100 killed and missing uh, protesters, uh, 27, I think, policemen killed and much more wounded. Uh, president on the run, together with uh, uh, dozens of high officials, including uh, the top officers, generals of this Ukrainian Secret Service, who turned out to be Russian citizens, and uh, the army generals who turned out to be Russian citizens. So, I mean, Russia was then already ready to control, to take over control of Ukraine. It didn't happen. So now, I mean, we have the situation when Russia is trying to just to occupy the country. Yes. Did I answer the question? Ah, uh, <laughs> I, I think so. You did better than answer the question. Your answers are better than my questions. <laughs> I mean, I've got down here, are you all actually drug addicts in neo-Nazis? Uh, well, well, I mean, I, I never tried drugs. Oh. Uh, I think neo-Nazis exist in every country, depending uh, on the political situation. And I assume there are more neo-Nazis in Russia, because Russia is bigger than in Ukraine. Uh, I can tell you only one thing, that there are no uh, nationalistic parties present, represented in the parliament. Yeah. So, I mean, it's quite interesting. I mean, if, 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 if Ukraine is a neo-Nazi state, as Putin says, why we don't have uh, Nazis or nationalists neither in the government nor in, uh, in the parliament? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, regarding, and, I mean, Putin says also that actually Ukraine is anti-Semitic state. I mean, the, there is a history of anti-Semitism anti in Tsar's Russia and on the U Ukrainian territory. And there were pogroms, of course, and they were, there was a famous uh, court case, Bailey's case, 10 years or 15 years after Dreyfus' case in uh, France. And it was very similar because Dreyfus' case was followed by uh, thousands of intellectuals, uh, uh, all around the world, and uh, Bailey's case was also, I mean, Thomas Mann and uh, uh, very famous uh, English writers were writing about this, and in, uh, in Kiev, in 1911, a boy, uh, Andrei Yushinsky, was found dead uh, in Jewish district on the territory of Brick Factory. And then the, 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 the authorities decided to present it as a, a Jewish uh, what do you call it? Blood label. Uh, blood label, yeah. Blood label, yeah. That, that, that he was killed by, by Jews. Uh, in order, they wanted to take blood to make matzah for their uh, Easter holiday. And uh, a manager of this brick uh, factory, uh, Mendel Bailis, was arrested. Uh, and the, the jury was uh, uh, organized. And in jury, there were peasants who were uneducated, and there were members of the nationalistic Russian Union chauvinistic Russian organization. And, and they still, they debated and they decided that Bayliss was not guilty in the end, but it was still the blood libel, it was still uh, murdered by Jews. And uh, I mean, you, you can find on YouTube documentaries about this case. So there was anti-Semitism, and it was supported by the Tsar's system. There was anti-Semitism after, after the Second World War, when Stalin decided that Jews uh, betrayed uh, Stalin, because he allowed them to go to Israel to turn Israel into an independent socialist state, and they didn't want to become socialist and didn't want to do anything with the Soviet Union. So uh, after that, after 1948, there was official anti-Semitism in, in the Soviet Union. But I mean, in Ukraine, Ukrainians voted, 73% of Ukrainians recently in uh, 2019 voted for Jewish Russian speaking president candidate Vladimir Zelensky. I didn't vote. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't vote. I know you didn't. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, but I mean. Uh, that is a large majority for yeah. a Russian speaking uh, Jewish guy in a place that's uh, yeah. allegedly. I mean, it's, uh, the thing, the, all the excuses seem so very very strange to me. But, uh, so since Maidan, you've had um, in, in Ukraine, in uh, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, Donbass, you've had this sort of permanent slow burn war going yeah. on. Um, which brings us to uh, 
to this book, uh, Grey Bees, which uh, Andrew wrote, ob obviously wrote before uh, the, the current war, but uh, a few years ago, uh, which is about, uh, well, it's, it's about a beekeeper <coughs> who lives in the grey zone, in, the no, in a village in the no man's land between the, the two sides, between the um, Russian separatists and the Ukrainian forces who fire their shells over his garden. And he's one of the only two people left in the village. There's him and Pashka, who uh, is a sympathizer with the, 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 the Russian side. Um, uh, what, what made you want to write about this? I mean, it's such an extraordinary... Well, I mean, first of all, I didn't plan to write anything about the war until the war is over in Donbass. I, I, I mean, the, the war which started in 2014 from annexation of Crimea, not yeah. this war. But what happened, actually, we had a huge influx of uh, refugees from Donbass. And in Kyiv, at some point, we had almost the same number of cars with uh, Donbass number plates and uh, cars with Kyiv's number plates. And they were dry, I mean, these were people, mostly actually middle class people who uh, were rich enough before the war to invest in flats in Kyiv, apartments in small houses around, and they just moved in. I mean, they were sort of uh, resettlers. I mean, the, the businessmen yeah. who were trying immediately to start businesses instead of Donetsk in, in Kyiv, and there were poorer people who were coming later in their ladders and cheap cars or without cars. And uh, uh, I have friends uh, who were born in Donetsk and lived in Donetsk and uh, moved to Kyiv uh, like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and now they, they were helping the new Comers from Donbass, and I started meeting these newcomers uh, at different parties and meetings. And I, I met once a young uh, businessman who uh, moved to Kiev, opened a cafe. Uh, he had already a house uh, near Kiev, and he told me that he was driving every month to Donbass to a village next to the front line because there are seven families left there, and he wanted to support them. And there was no shop, no infrastructure there. So and they couldn't, uh, uh, they didn't have access to medicine, to uh, to pills, etc. So he was bringing them what they asked for, yeah. and they were paying him with the jars of preserved vegetables with pickles, <coughs> and he was selling them in his cafe. And the, most of the buyers were also the other people from Donbass. And uh, I mean, when he talked about this village, I just decided to check again the map of Donbass. Uh, and I realized actually that this gray zone, and I mean actual gray zone is, is really a strip of land between positions of pro-Russian, uh, the separatists and uh, Russian helpers and Ukrainian uh, army. Yeah. And uh, the front line is 430 kilometers long, was, now it is longer. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so the gray zone is also uh, has the same lens. And there are, there are dozens of villages, parts of towns, I mean like Avdeevka, part of Avdeevka, this is an industrial town, was in the gray zone. And, and, and there was permanent uh, fire exchange of fire and fighting there, and there were still some people living in this area, uh, just in principle, because they didn't want to leave their, their houses, so usually old people. So, so I mean, I, uh, probably I was quite shocked to, to understand this, and, and I decided to write a story, and I... Uh, at that time, there were already dozens of books about war in Donbass, but all these books were about fighting, about us and them, about Ukrainian soldiers, heroic soldiers, and then nasty separatists, etc. So, I mean, the different quality of books, from good fiction to uh, more or less wartime propaganda. Yeah. But there were no books about civil, civil, uh, civil population. And I decided just to give voice to, to civilians who decided to stay there. And actually, I mean, people in Donbass, ordinary people, I mean, they're quite stubborn. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they never, never traveled a lot. And, and, and in fact, actually, I mean, this collective mentality there was supported by uh, Russian television. And one of the most popular TV channels there was a uh, Russian TV channel, which is called Nostalgie, which broadcasts. Soviet TV programs and Soviet black and white films uh, 24 hours a day. So, I mean, this nostalgia, Soviet nostalgia was there, supported for years and years and years, just like in Crimea. I mean, Russians were supporting the, not nostalgia, but some kind of uh, royal memories. So, because, I yeah. mean, there are palaces there and there are a lot of uh, Russian royal history. Uh, and so, all, all this uneducated, uh, Crimean Russian speakers, I mean, they're very proud uh, for royal past of Crimea. 
Yeah. And the main souvenirs were all these photo albums with photos of Tsar Nikolai II and counts and uh, uh, all these things. So, so, I mean, you, you can see, I think, I think it was very well planned uh, actions ahead of time because I think the annexation of Crimea probably was prepared 15, 20 years ago because once it happened, uh, everything was. Uh, been changed by specially trained people and I, I, I was uh, surprised most of all that the Russian uh, botanists, academicians, came to uh, list the endangered species and plants and put them in the Russian red book of endangered Russian uh, species oh, right. and plants. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, like, do you do this? I mean, you, you, you took over the, the, the territory. Do you, are you going to deal immediately with plants and fauna? Yeah. I don't know. A anyway, uh, I should, I mean, I forgot your question. Ah, <laughs> oh, my question was how you, um, oh, yes, how yes, you yes, approach the, about writing the, yeah. great uh, so, so I started actually writing this book and, uh, and immediately I thought that actually the ordinary Donbass people and the Donbass society was very different from other regions. And uh, the Ukrainian government in Kyiv actually was not controlling neither Crimea, because Crimea was an autonomous republic with its own constitution and with its own parliament. And after independence, Crimea was run by Crimean communists, I think for five or seven, six or seven years. Then they were replaced by gunsters. Yeah. Uh, and then, the, well, I mean, it's a separate story. But Donbass uh, is industrial area with huge plants and many towns uh, in Donbass were built around factories and plants. The plants and factories were built in 1930s because there are lots of mines, uh, there's metal ore, lots of resources. So, so I mean, this was one of the main Soviet industrial regions and uh, the people uh, who worked there, who, was, who were moved to live there, they were moved from Western Ukraine, from Central Russia, from everywhere. And they were uh, proletariat people. So, I mean, they were told that uh, we are, the country is proud for you. So, I mean, you are feeding uh, the country, you are creating the wealth. Uh, but you should be uh, obedient to your bosses. So, so, you know, I mean, it's like an army of proletariat. And, and people are, I mean, they were quite passive politically. They were told for which party to vote. And every time there would be a new regional party. Uh, because... Uh, some politicians, they decided uh, not to go into ideological discussions uh, regarding the elections, but just to divide the population into Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking, or those who live in Donbass and those who live in Galicia, in Galicia, in Western Ukraine. So, I mean, we have uh, the Galician party in Western Ukraine, uh, not represented in the parliament, and we had uh, the party of regions, uh, with which the uh, ex-president Yanukovych came to, to power. And this was a party for which practically all the inhabitants of Donbass were supposed to vote. And, uh, uh, and in, in fact, uh, I mean, people there they were always hardworking, uh, not always, uh, I mean, they had their own intelligence, and in fact, actually, what happened after the, the, the war started there, uh, all the elite of Donbass left. Those who were living next to Russia, they went to Russia. Those who lived next to Ukraine le left for Ukraine. And those who had political sympathies from, uh, for Russia or for Ukraine, they also left according to their political sympathies. But, but generally, ordinary people, they were always behaving like bees. I mean, they were creating wealth and they were not asking for reward. And they were happy with what they had. Yeah. Uh, and th this is why I immediately decided that I should have bees in the... Uh, in the novel because, I mean, the main character, Sergei Sergeyevich, or simply Sergeyevich, I mean, he is like a bee. He is looking after six beehives, but in fact, actually, he, his, he was left by his wife because he didn't want to move to a bigger city, and she was from a big city, so uh, she and, her do and their daughter, they went to live separately, and he remained in this village with his six beehives. And in yeah. the war, in the beginning of the war, he doesn't, doesn't understand the reason for the war, but he, be, he tries to defend his beehives, he keeps them in the winter, in the barn, he uh, created some kind of metal uh, protection for them, and he's defending their sleep, yes, winter sleep. But he is dreaming of taking them away 
from the war zone to Ukrainian man mainland for the summer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he doesn't have money, but he has uh, his own currency, honey. And uh, when a Ukrainian soldier comes to him and he offers him tea with honey, and the soldier says that, well, your honey is a bit bitter. And he realizes that actually the bees are collecting pollen on the fields which are filled with uh, craters from uh, explosions. And uh, the, 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 so the honey bears the taste or aftertaste of gunpowder, burned gunpowder. So he, he starts dreaming of uh, letting his bees to collect pollen in the peaceful areas. Yes, he then goes off on a, a, a sort of tour, yeah, not I mean, entirely, of, of, of Ukraine. He goes to... He goes to Zaporizhia yeah. region, which is now the war zone. And then uh, after conflict with the locals, uh, he goes to Crimea, already annexed Crimea, because he used to know Crimean Tatar beekeeper in 1990s, and yes. he thinks he will stay with, with, uh, with him this, uh, during the summer. Now, you, I mean, obviously you didn't know the war was coming when you wrote this, but um, there are an awful lot of the, um, the, the current war was coming when you wrote this. An awful lot of the, the issues uh, in this book are rise up right now at, at, at the moment. And, and just uh, in case anyone didn't realise, uh, Andre was in Ukraine um, until uh, Thursday. Uh, so, Thursday. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Th Thursday and then... And I'll be back in Ukraine I mean, tomorrow. Yeah. 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 And this is a flying visit. Yeah, but I hope not the last one. Yes. Can, can you uh, tell us a bit about what it was like um, uh, leaving Kiev and uh, what the, 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 the day the, the war started? I know you've been asked this many times now, but... Well, I mean, for, uh, I'm happy that actually our kids at that time, uh, they were in Lviv, in western Ukraine, yeah. for a long weekend. But I mean, we were woken up at 5 o'clock in the morning on 24th of uh, February, one day after the so-called uh, Soviet Army Day, which is still celebrated in, in, in Russia. We were woken up by explosions in Kiev, which is quite incredible. Yeah. Uh, three uh, very loud explosions and then silence. And uh, I mean, I was just looking out of the window and it was quiet, nobody was outside. And then at six o'clock there were two more explosions. And, uh, and then I, I, I was still looking out the window and I didn't want to go out because there was nobody to ask. And I didn't, I mean, we don't watch television, so we didn't have an idea to switch on radio or television. But then suddenly I saw we have a small uh, park, tiny park in front of our house, and there were two ladies walking their dogs. But at seven o'clock, usually, I mean, the, the, the road is filled with cars, and there were no cars at all. And there were no cars until 9 or 10, and then it was already clear that the missiles hit uh, uh, suburb of Kiev, Brovary, and uh, there was explosion in Podil, in Jewish district. And this was the, the, the day of the war. I mean, the evening before uh, I cooked borscht for our guests, and I mean, I had a uh, brilliant uh, British uh, journalist, Luke Hardy, Harding, yeah. uh, for uh, several more people, and, uh, and also the Brazilian ambassador. <laughs> And I was joking that this might be the last borscht in Kyiv. So far it was the last borscht in Kyiv. And now uh, I think... No, like uh, last tango in Paris, but tastier, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, now actually everybody who were in our place, I mean, they, they also left Kyiv. We stayed next night uh, with our friend, uh, British writer and journalist Lily Hyde, who lives in Kyiv, used to live in Kyiv for many years. And actually, uh, because first we went around to look for the nearest bomb shelters, and we found one, but it was quite shabby and dirty and not really comfortable. Uh, and uh, all the shops were closed. Uh, 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 and then uh, Lily said that they, they have underground parking next door, and the security guard said that uh, if there is more shelling, they, op they will open the parking and it can be used as the uh, bomb shelter. So we decided to stay overnight, overnight uh, in her apartment, and we went to see the parking, uh, but it was closed. But there was a queue of people actually waiting for the parking to, to be open, including uh, a young lady with a baby in the stroller, and. Uh, young people with dogs and cats, with pets, actually. And I mean, what was in interesting, that the first queues after the beginning of the war were in front of the zoo shops. People were buying 
the uh, pet food. Uh, pe pe and now you cannot find any pet uh, pet food I I in Kiev. That's the. I mean, we have shortages of sugar, matches, and pet food now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, next day we decided to to go to the village because I mean we. I, I used to keep the village heated uh, every winter since 2014, just in case uh, we need to... Sorry, just to be clear. Andre's got a, a, a cottage in a village near, yeah. near, uh, about an hour. 60 miles, 60 yeah, miles away from Kiev to the west, yeah. yeah. And we offered our friend, uh, who is a teacher of music, uh, and her son to go with us. And uh, uh, But I, mean, I don't want to describe, the, I, mean, I already wrote about this journey. Yes. But anyway, it took us four and a half hours to get uh, to the village house first and on the way we were standing mostly standing in the in the jams and uh, at some point there was missile or something flying over our car and then two fighter jets and then we were standing next to the battle uh, going on in Gostomil so I mean we were listening to the explosions and uh, artillery shots etc in the end when we got to the village and that, that, that's where you grew up isn't it um, the, 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 uh, the well I grew up in Kiev uh, yeah well very Close to Gostomol. Yeah, yes. yeah, in Pushevadice I, I grew up, but uh, then we lived uh, near Antonov factory because my uh, father was test pilot for Antonov plane factory. And uh, I mean, you know that Ukraine built the biggest uh, freight plane in the world. It's called Maria Dream. The, the Russians destroyed it. It was used by the United Nations to deliver humanitarian aid to Africa, to all the countries after the earthquakes. Now there's this, the, the only uh, plane in the world doesn't exist anymore, and it was stationed in Gostomil. Yes. Yeah. Just as a point on the side there, you were talking about everyone queuing up outside the pet shops to buy pet food, as that's the most important thing. I was just wondering, because I, uh, obviously you, you're, uh, the, the, this book is about a guy who cares about his bees, and it's, um, they, the war is there going on around him, but he cares for the bees, and um, uh, you're probably your most famous book, uh, Death and the Penguin, is about a guy who cares only for his penguin that he, he rescued from uh, the zoo. Um, uh, the fall of communism and all around him there is this uh, gangsterism and conspiracy and he's just trying to look after a penguin. Is this a, um, are, uh, is this a, a part of the Ukrainian national character, to go back to that? And if we, if we can talk about a Ukrainian national character, the love of animals. Well, the, I mean, uh, I don't think. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I think it is universal uh, love for animals. It, it's not specifically Ukrainian. I mean, we have uh, maybe uh, we have more cats maybe than in Britain. People in Britain, yeah. Because cats are extremely popular in Ukraine, and some people keep the cats only to f take photos of them and put on Instagram <laughs> or, or on, on Facebook. So, I mean, I, I get this feeling very often, but I, I started doing the same. Are we? <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a cat. I mean, my, my brother's family has a hamster and cat. I mean, they, uh, they uh, left Kiev three days ago, and I was helping them to find a safe uh, route, and I was keeping in touch while they got 150 kilometers away, sort of 110 miles away to the south, and, uh, and they are in a very basic uh, Ukrainian village hut with a b wood burning stove and they are there with the Pepin the cat and Simeon the hamster. <laughs> so I mean uh, I get the photo, I, I'm asking my older brother to take photos of both of them and send to me and I, I, I find it really sort of relaxing to, to post from time to time the photos of Pepin the cat or Simeon the hamster and to tell about them on, mostly on Twitter because I mean the first night was very cold and they couldn't uh, hit the, the house, they slept full, fully dressed, and uh, Simeon the hamster got cold. So, yeah. I mean, he, the, the hamster is sick now, but the cat is fine. Thank God. There, there is a novel in this. There's got to be another novel in this. Um, maybe. There will be. I think yeah. uh, we, because uh, we said we'd do about 45 minutes of talk, and then uh, sort of open things up, questions. And we will ask Colesa to... Uh, manage the questions, yeah. Yeah. And there is a nice place next to Grand Piano. Thank you. Um, this, this was fascinating to listen to because uh, I know your books um, are always on serious matters, 
sometimes they're a bit grim, let's face it, uh, but they're always full of laughter. And I don't remember last time I laughed in, in the last 17 days, so thank you for making us laugh. Thank you. Thank you. You thought there's something also very quite unique uh, in, in this last phase of Putin's war against Ukraine. So many memes appeared. One of the first jokes that came out of Ukraine was in the, in the second or third day of fighting, basically saying, NATO can now apply to join Ukraine. And now it's the kind of way of managing. I think NATO is afraid to join <laughs> Ukraine. <laughs> no, I think that is okay for sure. So I like the one that the uh, Ukrainian Farmers Union is going to be the best equipped fighting force in the entire world. Absolutely, with so many tanks. <laughs> yes. Well, 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 I mean, in fact, Ukraine has 800,000 members of the National Hunting Association with over one million and a half registered weapons. And nobody knows the number of unregistered weapons. Yeah. 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 So it's not an easy target for, uh, I mean, for Putin, for sure. even from this point of view. Right, so let's take some questions. We have about half an hour, so maybe a bit more. Um, okay, well, Maria, please go ahead. Just a quick follow-up question about animals, because lots of my friends uh, in Ukraine are not eating because of their animals, because it's not easy to travel with them. And I just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit more. And another question that lots of people have been reaching us, out to us about um, at the Institute is, are there any charities specifically for animals? But, um, at the moment to take care of and what's happening with the zoos in Ukraine and all of the different places where animals need to be protected. Well, Kiev, Kiev Zoo has now uh, food for animals for two weeks to come. Uh, at some point there was information uh, circulated asking Kievites to keep edible waste and uh, keep it in the fridge and pass it uh, to the uh, volunteers to be taken to the animals, but I don't. I think there is no need now for, for the moment. Uh, in fact, actually, there is a tragedy connected with the uh, animal charity uh, because uh, in Gostomil there was one of the biggest uh, stray dog dogs uh, shelter uh, run by an uh, aged professor from uh, Kiev Polytechnic University and his wife. And me and my wife, we, we used to drive there and to bring dozens of kilos of pet food uh, because uh, the, 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 I mean, I should probably explain that there are two English language theatres in Kyiv, amateur theatres. One of them was run by my wife and uh, uh, one of the representatives of this Kyiv players is here. I'm very <laughs> you played there, yeah? And uh, I used to be at the box office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all the proceeds from the uh, performances were uh, actually used to buy pet food for this shelter and we used to go there. And when the war was going, well, the fighting was going on and the fighting there is going on until today, Key volunteers, one uh, a lady, a girl student, and two boys, they went uh, to this shelter to bring pet food because uh, the dogs were hungry. I mean, they, 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 they were in the cages and there was nobody looking after them. And, uh, and, and these three young people were killed by Russians. And also, the biggest Kharkiv uh, dog shelter was bombed, so many dogs were killed there. So, I mean, the, uh, every aspect of life in Ukraine was destroyed by Russian aggression, including actually uh, the work of the animal charities. And I, I, have no, I haven't heard that the animals uh, are taken uh, from the uh, war zone. I, I, I don't have any information on this. And just to add, I've heard of pet patrol basically operating in different cities, so people going to abandoned flats and trying to rescue, or to um, buildings that, were, that already collapsed from shelling and trying to rescue. I, I, I know about one cat that will probably die, if not dead now, because the cat, uh, the, the owner uh, left with children uh, and uh, thinking that she will return. Uh, and then she has uh, one set of keys and the second set of key was with somebody who also left Kyiv. So, I mean, the, this cat is inside the locked uh, flat. Uh, sir, please. Uh, it's, I think it's fair to say you're a bit of a skeptic about Zelensky. Yes, I am, yep. Um, have you changed your view? And also, if I can speak to the second question, uh, what do you think of the prospects if Russia manages to take even, you know, to Kiev and the rest of even Ukraine? Uh, what do you think prospects of it managing to keep control, especially given what you talked about with Euro and the 
you know, natural tendency of Ukrainians to rebel? Well, I mean, first about Zelensky, uh, I was critical about uh, his political actions and uh, his inexperience and his uh, naivety regarding possible talks with, Zelen with, with Putin because he said that he will stop the war in one year, he will look into the eyes of Putin and he will see the peace there, etc. Uh, the way he is behaving now is great. Uh, this is the only way to save the country when the leader shows firmness and uh, doesn't care about his own safety. And, uh, and I think actually the, his behavior today helps a lot uh, uh, the general morale uh, in Ukraine. Uh, regarding uh, Kyiv, I mean, I think uh, Kyiv might be turned into New Stalingrad because uh, uh, lots of people are staying there. I mean, like in, in, in the house where we live, uh, more than half of people uh, remained. And they are checking actually the, the street. They have a Viber chat. And, uh, and they, what they were recently doing, I mean, because somebody is uh, uh, putting uh, the so-called reflective targets for the missiles on different targets, Russian targets in Kyiv. And there were already five of these square targets removed from our house by the young inhabitants who remained in Kyiv. So I, I assume a lot of young people also uh, are now checking every, everywhere for, for these targets. And, uh, uh, I, 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 a lot of people became specialists in war things Absolutely. because I never knew that actually that you, you can attract a missile by putting something uh, special cheap or special, uh, I don't know, ob object uh, attach it to, to a place which should be hit by the missile. Yeah, we've all become arm, armchair special forces, haven't we? Of, of late. Yeah. I should j just point out, um, uh, it's the, the, the block of flats you live in rather than your house. Just a tiny linguistic point there in yeah. case anyone was confused. It's not there. Lots of people left in Andre's house, but in, in, in the block. Yeah, but yeah, it's not a, Sorry. I mean, it's, it's a house more than 100 years old with approximately 20 flats. So it's not a high rise. Yeah. 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 Um, can I just ask you, it's been suggested that the, the Russians have a kind of hit list of uh, senior officials and intellectuals that they would like to, uh, to target to, to send to the Gulag or worse. Is that something which concerns you at the moment? Well, it concerns me because we have a, a, in Ukrainian history uh, a page, a very sad page, when Practically all Ukrainian writers and poets were executed in 1930s. So the whole generation. First they were taken to northern Russia, uh, to the island, what was the... Uh, Valdai? No, no, it's not Valdai, it's... Uh, Valam, to the Valam, where, you can, where there is a Russian uh, monastery now. Uh, and then they were executed there. And, and so uh, practically Ukraine was deprived of, of, of its own literature. And uh, all, most of the writers today, they, they were always critical about Kremlin and they were always critical about any Ukrainian government because, I mean, the culture in Ukraine was first ignored by, by the Ukrainian politicians and only from 2015 uh, politicians understood that actually you cannot create the nation without culture. You cannot unite people because, I mean, if you don't organize for example, premiere of the, of the same Ukrainian film in every Ukrainian town and city in the West and the East, you will not be able to create cultural context for the nation. Uh, and in this sense, of course, uh, uh, intellectuals are the targets. And we see uh, uh, what was happening before the war. I mean, like uh, uh, there is a cult uh, uh, poet in Ukraine and singer Sergei Zhadan, I think many of you know about them, uh, he was invited several years ago to Belarus uh, to have a reading and he came to Minsk and he was kidnapped from the hotel by Belarusian police and he was obviously was going to be taken to a Russian border and passed on to uh, FSB but he managed to send a message I think to the embassy and he was saved and uh, delivered by car to the border. So I mean th there were already attacks and plans uh, to uh, remove uh, uh, Ukrainian intellectuals from active uh, political and social life. So I don't expect uh, uh, it to be different now. Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, the, the, all the plans 
including the plans for the war, they, they were meticulously prepared. So I assume there are lists, because I mean now in occupied Melitopol, uh, Russia is uh, checking the addresses of local intellectuals and journalists. And we have one of our pen members there in hiding, and I mean, and we get some, some news from there. And uh, there was already uh, the director of uh, local history museum, uh, Leila Ibrahimova, Crimean Tata, was already kidnapped, then returned. And then the telephones were taken away from all members of her family, and nobody was able to talk to her after she came back. And then she was told that she will be taken again for inter interrogation, and since then I, I haven't heard from her. Now I will use my position of uh, my position here as, ch as chair and ask you a quick question myself. You mentioned Penn Ukraine just now. You wrote a really powerful statement um, recently as president of Penn Ukraine about the sort of you know insistence of having continuing conversation with Russian literary well, Russian writers with um, others in Russia as means of suggestions, as means of continuing a dialogue. Would you like to say something about that? Because then, I mean, these kind of discussions are being held here. You know, wh who should we boycott? What organizations? Whether we should continue um, dialogue with individuals and so on? I just wanted you to. Well, I mean, the, the, the issue uh, actually is. Uh... Some, has something to do with Germany because I mean Germany still wants to trade with Russia to buy gas and uh, uh, petrol or oil uh, without uh, understanding that actually uh, when any German family is heating house with, Ger uh, with Russian gas they are financing the war against uh, Ukraine but uh, German NGOs and different organizations including German PEN they, uh, they were trying to sort of uh, organize uh, dialogues, public dialogues between uh, good Russian writers and good Ukrainian writers. And I mean, uh, uh, it's difficult to imagine uh, uh, such a dialogue, especially uh, taking into consideration writers that they, they were suggesting they were not openly against Putin. They were sort of silent. They didn't react to, to what is happening. There are writers who, who are uh, on the Ukrainian side and who signed the letter uh, against the war and against Putin's politics. And, and these are Vladimir Sorokin, Dmitry Bykov, Igor Irtenev, Shenderovich, Boris Akunin, and some others, about approximately 500. Uh, but I mean, there are more writers who signed the open letter published in uh, Literaturna Gazeta, Literary Gazette in Moscow, uh, supporting the aggression against uh, Ukraine, supporting the denazification of Ukraine. And uh, among the people who signed this letter, there are five, five members of Russian PEN, including the board member, Vice President Evgeny Popov. And so, I mean, I, I, I don't see any possibility uh, to organize uh, this pompous, peaceful dialogue in the time when civilians are being killed. I, I, I don't mind to have a dialogue with Vladimir Sorokin, but Sorokin is not responsible uh, for the Kremlin's actions. Sorokin mostly lives in Berlin. I mean, Mikhail Shishkin, who refused uh, the uh, literary prizes from, from Russia, he lives in, in Switzerland. He is against Putin. He was always for Ukraine. I mean, the, the dialogues with them are possible, but even with them, it will be provoking bitter feelings uh, among the Ukrainian intellectual society. So there was a question just there, then another question over there, and I'll come back to the side in a second. Could I ask you a question about Grey Beans? Yeah. Your hero, Sergei, is a, is a man of great initiative. He can drive a car with no windows uh, halfway across uh, Ukraine and, and fix um, beehives. When he visits the Tartar region, in my reading, he becomes highly tentative. Highly? Tentative. He doesn't quite know how to behave yeah. with the Muslim family and whether he should get engaged when previously he's been very clear about, about helping other people. And I know you have said previously that you're interested in, in, in the people who live in the grey zone as, as, as expressing part of the mentality of the Ukraine. What, what could we understand about the future of the Tatar community in Ukraine if Ukrainians are tentative about helping them? 
Well, actually, uh, Ukrainians in central Ukraine or in western Ukraine, they are much more aware about traditions and history of Crimean Tatars. I mean, we know uh, all that they were deported by the order of Stalin in 1943, that uh, during the deportation of 300,000 people, 12,000 died on the way. They were sent to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. They lived there. They were dreaming to come back, but they were not allowed to, to go uh, not only to back to Crimea, but to go to Moscow. So they were sometimes sneaking into Moscow to protest against their plight. But uh, I mean, now that uh, uh, Ukrainians know the Crimean Tatar history and th there is no issue of uh, not knowing how to behave uh, with with the Muslim part of Ukrainian uh, population. And we always had a lot of Muslims, uh, not only Crimean Tatars, but uh, we say just, just Tatars. Uh, in the south of Ukraine. But uh, what I wanted to say that the uh, one of the uh, problems uh, that we had uh, coming to, to Maidan, etc., uh, uh, that uh, the different regions of Ukraine were not uh, internally integrated. People didn't know how Ukrainian Hungarians live. So people didn't poison any uh, Western uh, defectors to, to, to Soviet Union or to Russia. Uh, I don't know if uh, the West has developed uh, a Western equivalent of Novichok or something else. Uh, my hopes are with natural causes. <laughs> We've heard from Russians who are shocked by all this that they used to see or see Ukrainians as friends, like it was like uh, the, the nations had a relationship. Uh, and you've spoken about the difference between the nations, but I'm curious to know if it used to be a kinship or still is a kinship between Russia and Ukraine. Well, I mean, Gogol created a fashion for everything Ukrainian. Uh, in his life through his novels and he even introduced lots of Ukrainian words into Russian language. So I mean uh, after that uh, and it, I'm talking about the uh, second part of 19th century uh, you, many Russian aristocrats treated Ukrainians as lovely pets. Even when they were punishing them I mean like uh, Shevchenko was uh, the national poet of Ukraine he was punished by been sent for 25 years to serve in the Russian army and he was treated nicely by the officers, Russian officers, in the, he was stationed in Kazakhstan. So he was treated like a nice pet and I mean this was a typical uh, attitude uh, in 19th century. Uh, in the Soviet times, I mean Lenin didn't like Ukrainians, didn't trust Ukrainians, he, Lenin never went to Ukraine, never visited Ukraine. Uh, he considered them potential traitors because he probably saw the difference between Russians and Ukrainians and, and he, his dream was uh, 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 to create a, the, the state where people will have no uh, nationality. So the, the word Soviet will replace the Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Ukrainians, Russians, everybody will be the same and everybody will be speaking Russian. So I mean Western Ukraine which became part of Ukrainian Socialist Republic uh, de facto after the Second World War, they managed to keep their Ukrainian language, Ukrainian roots, Ukrainian traditions and, and uh, thanks to them actually Ukrainian traditions and Ukrainian mentality uh, survived and then started growing and replacing, removing uh, Russian Soviet collective mentality from Ukrainian soil. Yeah. But, uh, uh, th there were friendships, of course, between Russians and Ukrainians, uh, but uh, on, on individual level, uh, uh, I mean, it's po it was possible, it was easy. But there were lots of jokes about difference between Russians and Ukrainians. And, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the joke I have now in mind, probably not politically correct, and it's mostly about Ukrainians, not about Russians. Because, I mean, many years ago I participated with my older brother in illegal joke-telling competitions in, uh, in Crimea. <laughs> but uh, but I, 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 I will now translate, maybe it will not funny in English. Because very often, actually, what we are laughing at uh, is considered either vulgar or politically incorrect uh, in normal countries. 
<laughs> but I mean, but, but I mean, the, this is the joke that I was told recently. So this is quite a, a, a new joke, and and I don't know what you will think about this, but uh, but it, it it was made up by people when the war already started. So uh, we have a word uh, "kum," which means that uh, somebody who uh, christened your baby, and his wife is also kuma, and so they, they, they this kuma kums they, they are like relatives. They they always together, they help each other. So one kum is rushing to the house of the other kum and shouts, uh, kum, your wife uh, died. And the, the husband of this dead wife is eating borscht, beetroot soup, traditional Ukrainian uh, dish. And the, the first kum is puzzled that he doesn't react and he shouts again, your wife died, I, was, I saw her, she was actually hanging the uh, washings and then suddenly uh, she uh, uh, fell down and I, I, I rushed to her and, and she was dead. And the, the other one is the husband is eating borscht quietly and doesn't react. So the, uh, the kum is in despair, shouts, you don't hear me, you don't hear me. And uh, the first one, the husband says, I hear you. Uh, wait, I'll finish the borscht and then you will see how hysterical I am. <laughs> And this is the time I think to take two last questions. <laughs> so, Makola, I don't know about the back. Um, I just wanted to ask you a good question. Um, the question is related to your stink one stat, like uh, the song about Russians, whether the Russians love their children too. So, Russia you know, participated in the Chechen War, in Afghan War, and there were a lot of actually Russian moms who experienced a lot of suffering losing their children, and so many of them losing right now their children in Ukraine. Um, the the conglomeration of those monks in Russia, they're making the statement that they're doing the right thing in Ukraine right now, and a lot of those monks are being silent, and they are, you know, why so? Why they're not screaming about their children, you know, being killed in Ukraine? Why they're not raising? Because they're supposed to be the first, um, I should say, point of contact, right? Because they are related to this, and they, you know, they suffer it in a different way, and so it's, you know, being comparison to generals who don't know those soldiers. Well, in Russia there was a more or less powerful organization, which was NGO, which was called uh, Soldier, Soldiers Mothers, yeah. And they were protesting against, uh, uh, well, not Russian politics, but uh, against mistreatment of soldiers and uh, uh, against uh, the fact that actually life of Russian soldier costs nothing uh, for generals. Uh, but uh, I think they were suppressed and then they, they were disbanded just like a, a memorial organization. Uh, then uh, also uh, impartially responsible is uh, the arts uh, uh, and the cul Russian culture because I mean, uh, in Russia uh, the writers uh, are still engineers of human souls. They're supposed to write books which will educate uh, the readers and uh, teach them how to be a patriotic uh, person. And so they, probably the, the mothers today think that it is not patriotic to talk about lost children because they are defending uh, motherland's interests. Yeah. We can hope that that's going to change, hopefully. I was really intrigued earlier on in your talk when you said Russia was actually created by the Ukraine as it built Moscow. And also the fact that you think, and a lot of people here think, Ukrainians are very anti totalitarian that's a country of 100% conservatives. The big question at the moment for the last few 10 days, as President Zelensky is asking for uh, clearance of the skies, uh, an air embargo on all flights and no fly zone. And all the people in NATO have been saying, oh, we can't possibly do that because we might end up having a direct confrontation, confrontation with Russian fighters. Now, ignoring the question that NATO is already involved, and the fact the Polish won't transfer their leagues if not to American air base, but they could take them to Turkey. We've also got news and then on the flight to Ukraine. One thing struck me that nobody seems to have brought up. In the Second World War in 1940, Britain was outnumbered roughly four or five to one by the Luftwaffe during the uh, Battle of Britain on the south coast down here. And the reason why Britain survived was they had this thing called radar, which allowed the RAF to know when the German planes were coming and go up and pick them off and then go back again. Although they were outnumbered, they could actually cope with it. 
Now, the situation seems to be fairly similar in Ukraine at the moment. The Russians have got control of the skies, and the Ukrainian Air Force can't cope with this because it's an arms question. However, there is a thing called AWACS. AWACS is run by the Americans, and they are airliners with, with very big radars on yeah. top. And the point about this radar is over the horizon radar, it can look a long way over countries. And the Americans could fly these planes on the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, Romania, all along the border of Ukraine and Belarus. And it could actually look over the horizon, pick up when the Soviet planes are coming out of Belarus or wherever to attack, for example, Kiev. So is that a question? Uh, the question is, why doesn't Leslie ask the Americans, who are controlled these airbag planes, to provide the information to the Ukrainian Air Force so they can do the same thing I have did in 1940. Although they're outnumbered, it would give them the advantage. So you were just a writer, but... Uh, no, no, I mean, take, I, uh, in fact, I know that one of X plane was flying uh, along Polish border recently. So it is possible and they can do it. Uh, I don't know what uh, uh, Zelensky is asking for uh, because I'm not a politician and I'm not in, uh, I, know, I don't know him personally and he wouldn't probably ask me what I think. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, if it is so logical, I mean, it should be probably done uh, by Americans themselves because, I mean, uh, America is helping Ukraine and uh, America is much more experienced in all the military things. Okay, Mark, I really want to offer you an opportunity to ask perhaps the final question, given that, uh, you know... Oh, I ran through my question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Ah, I, I think only just uh, a thank you very, very much, and it's um, it's it's been absolutely wonderful having this this chat. Well, th thank you very much. But uh, I mean, I want just to add one more sentence. I want to ask everybody to read as much as possible about Ukrainian history uh, and to get acquainted with Ukrainian culture in order to understand. Uh, because I, what I said, I said very uh, much in brief things, and uh, I mean, U Ukrainian history explains. Uh, today's situation very well uh, because I mean Ukrainians were dreaming about independence from 15th century they were independent then the independence was taken away several times uh, including in 1918 and uh, now uh, with Ukraine independent being independent 30 years already we have a generation of Ukrainians who cannot imagine being dependent and not living in a separate state uh, so uh, please uh, read uh, Timothy Snyder and Applebaum and uh, there are many Sergei Plachy, there are many good books in English available so, so and also that will be your contribution and and that will be your support for Ukraine also Indeed. and do read Andrei Kurkov's books and um, Mark's books too <laughs> yeah yeah by, by mine and uh, <laughs> follow Andrei on social media to get updates about Ukraine but also about uh, Simeon the hamster important updates I think at the moment I certainly follow them and please also follow us uh, on social media visit our website ukraineninstitute.org.uk on our homepage you can see information about how you can help Ukraine, what you can read, what sources you might want to turn to to get accurate information in English and share, share that information with your contacts and I'd really like to thank Mark and Andre for coming here and speaking to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.